Welcome to your Adela University with Jeff Snyder. My name is Emil Kalinowski. Jeff, we're going to be talking about the treasury curve inversion and how the first part that inverted, that got everyone's attention, if you don't look at the 20 and 30 years, but the 10 year, the first part that inverted was the 7 and 10 year. And some people might say, that doesn't count. What counts is the 10 year, 2 year spread or the 10 year, 3 month spread. Everything else is just parlor games. But in this article that you posted at Alhambra Investments, you go through, let me do the math, 30 years of treasury curve flattening and inversion by the 7 to 10 year spread. And you see it as a, as a leading indicator of trouble, sometimes recession, sometimes just global trouble. And we're going to go over all of those. Jeff, we're going to start all the way back in 1990 and talk about the inversion there. But before we get into the details, is there any more overview that we should give the audience? Yeah, just a general yield curve, general money curve overview. Whenever we look at these curves, we always look at them as almost like two different curves. So it makes sense why these curve mechanics that we're going to describe actually happen because the front end of the curve is looking at different factors than the back end of the curve. The front end of the curve is more about money alternatives. If you're a two-year note holder, you're holding a U.S. A US Treasury note that, that's maturing in two years. You're not so much concerned about inflation and growth prospects as you are, where are my money alternative rates going to be in two years? So if I'm holding a two-year note that's yielding, say, 2%, for example, and you think the repo rate in that two-year period is going to be better than 2%, you're going to adjust your holdings in the two-year Treasury note based on short-term money rates, including how the Federal Reserve affects short-term money rates by raising or lowering its federal funds target range. So the front end of the curve tends to be more aligned with monetary alternatives, whereas the back end of the curve is all about growth and inflation expectations. Irving Fisher, back in the early part of the 20th century, and many economists before him in the 19th century. So for hundreds of years, we decompose bond yields into growth and inflation expectations because that's what they really are. And where those two curves sort of intersect and start to you know, mix and mingle with each other is right around the middle. So that five-year, seven-year, 10-year space where you start going from more purely money alternatives to more of longer run economic and financial fund fundamentals. And so if we have competing factors or competing sets of perceptions, they're going to start to collide in that middle space. Now, this came up during a question and answer, the, the press conference after the rate hike by the Federal Reserve on March 16th, 2022. Chairman Powell went in front of the audience and wanted to talk about all sorts of things. But even the financial press said, hey, have you noticed that some of these tenors are inverting? And Mr. Powell said, come on, that's what he said. He said, so I guess I would start by saying that, in my view, the probability of a recession within the next year is not particularly elevated. And why do I say that? Aggregate demand is currently strong and more, most forecasters expect it to remain so. And then somebody said, are you for real? And he, he continued, <laughs> quote, I say that our intention is to bring inflation back down to 2% while still sustaining a strong labor market and that the economy is very strong. If you look at where forecasters are, you, people are forecasting growth that's strong within the context of U.S. potential economic output. So that's the Fed saying, ignore the 7 to 10 year spread that inverted way back when, and most of the curve is now broadening, the inversion is broadening and deepening. Ignore that because of the forecasters. And Jeff, we're going to go yeah, through history. Yeah, let's depend on for Right. Who are these forecasters? And this is not the first time. In fact, every time we go through these periods, the Fed says, ignore the market. There's these forecasts. Who are these forecasters? And the forecasters are economists who use the same econometric models that the Federal Reserve does. So basically, Jay Powell is saying, all the people who use the same tools that I do agree with me that everything's going to be fine and pay no attention to that historically validated market signal because for reasons that we're not going to give you today. We have a bunch of forecasters using sophisticated but useless regression models telling us that everything is going to be hunky-dory. You labeled that as circular logic in your article, Jeff, but I think you're being a little bit too harsh because who cares what shape the logic it is in? 
if it's rectangular <laughs> or circular, it's still logic. Okay, let's go back in time. The Gulf War, 1990. We're just focusing on the seven to 10 year, ladies and gentlemen. 1990, 1991, what did the seven to 10 year spread do? Did it invert? Did it predict a recession? How far ahead? Interesting thing about 1990 is that the, the inversion happened relatively quickly. It started again in that middle space, the seven to 10 year spread. And it wasn't just the Gulf War. In fact, the Gulf War wasn't even part of the equation here. It was more the SNL crisis and the fact that the bank lending was drying up and banks were failing all over the, over the country. And so we had this yield curve inversion early part of 1990 and then recession in a matter of months. You had the oil price spike when Saddam's you know, army started to move around closer to Kuwait. So oil prices rose between March and uh, the summer by the time the, the Iraqis did invade Kuwait. So you had an oil price spike. You had the S&P crisis. You had a lot of bad stuff. Yield curve inverts. And then months later, boom, recession. I have it as five months later, but who's counting? Soon. That one was very soon. Number two, Asian financial crisis, or as we like to refer to it, euro dollar zero. What did we see? 96, 97, 98. Was it predicted? Now, this is not the United States. It's the Asian financial crisis. So what should the U.S. United States Treasury yield curve have anything to do with Asia? What did we see during that time period? Dollars. It's dollars, right? And U.S. Treasuries are the store of value component or major store of value component to the euro dollars medium of exchange. So there's a Definite financial and monetary link between U.S. treasuries around the world, the availability of money around the world, and the economic consequences or the economic implications of what's going on from money and finance around the world. And the U.S. Treasury yield curve did invert slightly in the 7 to 10 space and around that period, too, because it was, it, the, it was the market saying, you know, there's more, more bad here than not. But was it referring to... The Asian financial crisis, which was, quote unquote, wrapping up right at that point, or was it predicting the dot-com recession, which was 2000, 2001? I don't, you know, that's the thing, Emil. I don't know how you separate the two of them, because I know in most people's minds, the Asian financial crisis in 97, 98 is obviously very different from the dot-com recession that didn't show up until 2001. I mean, those are several years apart, but I think in some ways they're actually linked. So I think in some ways the market was saying, you know, we've got bad stuff happening in Asia that's going to dampen demand or dampen economic activity around the world so that if this dot-com bubble thing ever actually does burst, that maybe creates a, a, a couple of, you know, self-reinforcing negative factors where maybe the, the weakened global economy and the dot-com bubble burst, maybe that does actually produce a recession. So yeah, you're right in one sense. The yield curve in 97, 98 wasn't specifically about the United States economy. It was about global economic uh, potential that was uh, at that time more negative than not. And then in, in the seven to tens, never really normalized during the dot com, the really the, the height of the dot com bubble, because I think the market was sort of like, you yeah, <laughs> stocks are going through. The, I mean, we haven't seen stocks behave like this since the 20s. So. You know, there's there's a lot of lot of negative factors there too. Even though the U.S. economy during that period from '96 forward seemed to be invulnerable, so the market was just hedging against non-specific uh, future future possibilities that you know eventually became more and more likely. Those future possibilities became increasingly likely in late 2006, or at least even early 2006. Jeff, that was the next time. We had a serious problem. What were the sevens and tens doing between February 2006 and uh, December 2007 when the US recession began and the global financial crisis began, or euro dollar number one, as we like to call it? Same kind of process. You know, the, the, the Federal Reserve was hiking interest rates at the time since two, June, June of 2004 through June of 2006, 17 straight quarter point raises, so brought the federal funds target rate from 1% all the way to five and a quarter percent. Yet during that time, long run treasury yields weren't really moving. Short run treasury yields were, because as we said, you think about them as two different curves. Those curves started to collide around late 2005, early 2006, where we finally got a little tiny bit of inversion, which was the bond market, the long end of the bond market saying, 
we're not seeing the same risks as Alan Greenspan claims to. He's he's raising rates, and then by then it was Ben Bernanke, but Greenspan and Bernanke were raising rates because they thought the U.S. economy was at risk of overheating and that inflation was the, the by far the biggest problem the Fed need to handle. When the bond market, again, going back to like it was in 97, 98, 99, thinking ahead to, no, there's very different risks here than inflation. And those risks should be obvious to anybody who's at least walking around uh, places like Florida or Arizona, where the housing bubble was in full bloom, in, in reaching incredible excesses. So you can understand why long run treasuries would sort of resist the short run rate hikes that the Fed was trying to introduce because of wrongly assigning inflation as the biggest concern for the U.S. economy. So to early 2006, those two messages collided. We had slight inversion. The market came back to it more strongly in late 2006 on into 2007. And then, of course, you have the bad, the worst result, which is actually steepening, but it's the wrong kind of curve steepening where short term rates start to collapse faster than long term rates do, which is the signal that this is it. The thing that we've been worried about and hedging against has finally arrived. Now, obviously, there's a clear break be between what occurred before the global financial crisis and thereafter. So maybe. The, we know the monetary system changed. Maybe this measure of the monetary system no longer works in this new era that we're in. And so now we're going to look at euro dollar number two, euro dollar number three, and euro dollar number four. Jeff, euro dollar number two, the European sovereign debt crisis, 2011, 2012. What did the seven to 10 year spread do during that time period? Was it still a leading indicator? It was still a leading indicator, even though it never came close to inverting, it flattened out in a way that it shouldn't have. That's really when we pay attention, when we look at the analyze the yield curve, we're kind of looking at where it should be, because if we're into a robust recovery, the yield curve, especially with the low, the front end of the, of the curve, so low down near to zero, if we're getting into a recovery, normalization, that type of thing, we would expect the yield curve to steepen, dramatically steepen in the po most positive way. And so anything outside of that kind of steepening is, a, is an, a warning sign. It's an alarm bell. And in fact, the fact that the, uh, the yield curve, especially in the seven to 10 year space, had begun flattening as much as it did around the 2011, 2012 period, was a, it was definitely something that to be concerned about. Euro dollar number three, the BRICS bust up, as I like to call it. Again, we're not seeing the seven to 10 year spread go below zero. But we did see not just flattening, but a, a yield curve compression, didn't we? The spread. It got close. It got uncomfortably close. And again, this goes against what was supposed to be happening. You have the Fed terminating QE, the Fed looking forward to rate hikes early in 2015 because of the best jobs market in decade, when in fact, as you just said, the rest of the world was a total, total and utter mess. And even though the rest of the world, including China, was a mess, eventually that was going to hit the U.S. economy, too, because this is a globally synchronized process. And the yield curve was warning throughout 2014 and into early 2015, when the 7 to 10 spread got very close to zero, very close to inverting. It flattened out to almost nothing. That was a powerful warning sign that Janet Yellen and her Fed were very wrong about what was about to happen in 2015. She thought it was full and complete economic recovery, acceleration, if not overheating. That's why they were itching to raise rates in 2015. Instead, as the 7 to 10 spread had warned, they would only, the FOMC would only do one rate hike in December of 2015, and then pause for an entire year afterward because the, the yield curve flattening was predictive. It told you what was happening in the real economy, so much so that even the Fed had to shelve its rate hike normalization plan. Moving on to euro dollar number four, I haven't quite come up with a name for it. I like to think of it as a series of deglobalization shocks, even though deglobalization began in 2008, it became more pronounced. It was in the media, the, the orange people that didn't like trade, the tariffs, the trade wars, and then the shutting down of the logistical supply chains with COVID. What did we see? We know that twos and tens inverted. When did those invert? Or is, did the seven and tens come earlier? Did they ever invert? Did they come close to zero 
Is it still a good leading indicator? Euro dollar number four, Jeff. The two-year tenure spread inverted, but not until August of 2019. The seven to 10 year spread didn't invert, but it came so close. It was only, I think, one basis point off on a single day. And not only that, when that happened, May and June of 2018. So coincident to the euro dollar futures inversion, for example, the dollar's exchange value spiking and Urjit Patel talking about, you know, the, uh, the dollar funding has evaporated worldwide. The seven to 10 year spread flattened out to almost zero during this window, which was when everything really started, when Euro dollar number four, what, however, you, whatever catchy name you come up with for it, that's what's, that was when it really became, it went past the point of no return. So like 2015, when the seven to 10 year spread got that low, it was a warning sign that said, this is probably it. We're going into a downturn from here, maybe recession, we'll see. But even though the seven to tens at that time never inverted, that's exactly what would follow in a matter of mere months. Just like in 2015, when the seven tens got very near flat, it was within mere months. The U.S. economy was in near recession as the rest of the global economy was in full-blown recession. In 2018, same thing. You had recessions in Japan and Europe. At this, and then a couple months later, or mere months later, they had collapse in the treasury rates, bond yields around the rest of the world in 2019 recessions in many other places, including the two-year, 10-year inversion then too. So in every single case, even post-crisis, the 7 to 10-year, even when it doesn't invert, sends a very powerful signal when it flattens and gets close to it, which then raises, you know, gets our radar up even more because now the 7 in 2022, the 7 to 10-year spread has inverted and it has inverted now by quite a lot. So what is that saying that, you know, 2018 was a pretty powerful signal. What is it saying in 2022 when we've gone way beyond that? Jeff, my cocktail napkin notes here show we've gone through seven events. Four of them were U.S. recessions, and we had five, some overlap, five either global or regional dollar credit money collateral shortages. And in each case, we, we had correctly predicted the recession by the seven and 10 year except maybe for this last one where it was a basis point off, or a warning on a global basis. So it seems like for the U.S., it's dead on. If there's a U.S. recession, it's got an excellent track record. And for regional or global credit collateral dollar shortages, then flattening inversion or a shrinking spread, that's, it's still excellent. And I guess that's what we would tell Mr. J. Powell. But before we go, Jeff, it's not fair that we're picking only on Mr. J. Powell. Here's another wonderful quote from another central banker across the Atlantic. Quote, even in the bleakest scenario with second round effects with a boycott of gas and petrol and a worsening of the war that goes on for a long time, even in those scenarios, we have 2.3% growth. Miss Christine Lagarde, I had to bring out that quote because <laughs> those two the quotes forecasters are confident, right? These are famous last words, both of them. Yeah, both of them. Well, no, I think, Emil, our, our overall point is that just using the seven to 10 year calendar spread, just that one tiny part of the yield curve has shown itself to be a very highly predictive of eventual outcome. But that's the thing. You don't need to rely on just the seven to 10 year. When you see the seven to 10 year start to invert, you think, Okay, this could be bad. Now let's look at all the other indications that we have and put those together. So I think it's you know isolating the seven to ten year. Jay Powell's wrong to dismiss the signal, but it's not just the seven to ten year, it's all these others that go along with it that, that are portraying a very consistent message, which is the balance of risks are not inflation here. They're decidedly the opposite for not just the US, but the, really the global economic system, the global financial system, and the global monetary system, as you pointed out but sycophantic forecasters that want a job in the economics profession, maybe even at the Federal Reserve, well, they're forecasting exactly what the Federal Reserve wants to see. So Jeff, how can we weigh these two I competing think we need to signals? Ask whoever that was that uh, Christine Lagarde was using for her 2.3% minimum growth to wow. rerun the econometric models and see how much growth we get for a nuclear war. It probably would be, still be positive. <laughs> It's it's on par with Miss uh, Yellen's forecast that we will not, likely not see a 
another financial crisis in our lifetime. I, what, a year, two, two years, it was another financial crisis. Okay, all right, thank you.